everybody, Eddie G here with the NASCA Global Media Network. And today we have a special guest for our Spirit of Black History uh, portion for the month of February. And today's guest, guest, we have a fabulous young man. We have William Cody Anderson, radio broadcaster in Philadelphia and president of ACG Associates. And he is a black history mentor of mine who has done legendary things in the city of Philadelphia. And we're going to hear from him today to find out a little bit about that. How you doing today, Cody? I'm good. Uh, thank you for calling me a young man. I appreciate that. <laughs> hey, we're all young. You're as young also, as you feel. <laughs> I'd like to give a shout out today to all uh, HBCU students, uh, uh, graduates, alumni. It's a glorious time for us having a member of the HBCU become Vice President of the United States. There's some progress being made. We're getting there. We have a long way to go. And that's kind of part of what Black history is about. You know, understanding where we came from and where we're going. And I think it's very important. Um, I know you have been involved in the radio industry for a long time. And we would like to know how you got started and what was it that inspired you to follow that dream? Well, I cannot tell you that it was planned uh, because after graduating from Central State, I taught school for a while, and um, and then I moved to Philadelphia, and I was about to become a federal narcotics agent uh, when a friend of mine offered me a job as an account executive at the the largest uh, uh, African American program station in the city, which was WDAS AM and FM radio. Uh, so I took it, not even knowing what an account executive was and kind of learned uh, <clears throat> on the job and kind of moved from there, became uh, operations manager and then assistant to the general manager. And ultimately the station sold to a black group out of New York called National Black Network. And at that time they named me general manager. You, you made your way up the ranks pretty quickly. I did and uh, it was not easy because I was an outsider. I was from Chicago and uh, Philadelphians are very um, pro-Philadelphians, uh, even though the interesting thing about it is that most people who are holding positions and are really doing anything, and not, not myself included, are outside of, from outside of Philadelphia. Uh, so they, they pull for you internally, but they'll work against you when it comes to trying to grab that coveted spot. <laughs> so I found that to be interesting, you know, about Philadelphia. But it wasn't easy, and I, I was blessed to have come along at a time when they were there were actual uh, legends who were in the industry. In, in Philadelphia, you had Georgie Woods, Jimmy Bishop, uh, Butterball, Carl Helm, uh, Johnny O, John Bandy, Jocko. And then in Chicago, you had people like E. Rodney Jones and Herb Kent. In Detroit, you had uh, Perkins. In the South, you had Boogaloo. These guys were legendary. <clears throat> They actually controlled a lot of the information that went into black homes uh, around the country. So they were more powerful than they were given credit for. And they, for that reason, they were, they were marginalized by advertisers and, uh, and companies and corporations. Wow. And, you know, I was uh, on a panel a couple of years ago that talked about advertising in the black community and how, it just wasn't at the same level as it was in mainstream communities. And also there was a designation to Latin radio, Latin TV, where a lot of advertising was pushed in that direction. And it was, I guess it was understood that the black market would be okay with the white markets advertising. So it was kind of a process where they were skipped over. And even today, there's a lot of initiatives to kind of direct more advertising dollars to the African-American market. What do you think about that? A lot of the rating services or the rating services, which was Arbitron, which was the industry Bible, they incorporated surrounding counties that black radio stations then reach 
because we were the last to get signals. So we were always at the end of the dial with the lower, lowest power signals. And so we were strong in the cities, in the metropolitan areas, which is actually the areas they were trying to appeal to, but that didn't matter when they <clears throat> diluted our influence by including those other counties. So wow. even with that said, uh, our FM radio station, so I sat back and I watched, and I watched these various stations um, uh, rank number one and two in the market. And then we started working hard at it, uh, converted our FM station, which had a stronger signal to R&B. And uh, we ultimately became number one in the market, even with those restrictions. And at that time, um, I thought, wow, we're going to get all of this business that these other stations get when they're number one and two. And we started hearing no ethnic dictate. I'm sorry, your audience isn't the audience that we're looking for. So, I mean, it started then and it continues. And unfortunately, the only thing that works oftentimes is the threat of boycott or picketing or simply, which is the route I took, try to encourage my listeners to tell people where they spend their money to advertise with our station where they get their information. I thought that was reasonable enough, but our people don't always do that. Um, but um, advertising corporations don't know that. Uh, so we can still use that as a bluff and they can't afford to call it because oftentimes our people will respond to you calling our bluff. Well, a lot of things need to be changed in industry, in politics, in the community. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about radio and its impact on the African-American community. I know growing up, it was WDAS. We were listening to the radio all day. And now in my travels and even personally, uh, a traditional radio, the only time I would hear that is in the car because a lot of people don't have radios anymore in their house. And, and, and what they do is they'll listen on their phone and they'll listen on, on different forms, but the, the traditional over the airwaves radio seems to be at, at a sort of a disadvantage and the impact it has on a community. Do you feel it's the same and talk about how it was growing up with radio? Well, obviously, uh, minority owned radio stations, black owned radio stations had to make an adjustment to social media. Uh, and had to start streaming their broadcasts uh, to appeal to a different group. But for the most part, listeners are committed to these radio stations that are the center and the voice of their communities. So they're going to still find ways to listen to it on the radio, the older demographics. And the younger people now will respond via the stream. Uh, <clears throat> when I was growing up, that's all we had because other broadcasters were not interested in programs in the black community. If you had 25 radio stations in a market, 24 of them programmed to the, to the uh, general market uh, stations, only two to the black communities. Uh, yet we spend money disproportionately as it related to that. And so I think that to make the adjustment and start streaming is good, but, but folks are loyal to these radio stations. They realize now that this is where they get their information, their accurate information or their perspectives. Um, when we became number one in the, in the uh, market, which is what I mentioned earlier, at that point, about three or four other stations converted and start general market stations converted and start playing black music. The difference is they did not allow personality DJs. They did not allow the black commentary. They did not allow a lot of the public service that catered to our community. They appealed to our weakness and just started playing a lot of music consecutively, wouldn't let the DJs talk, and relied on giving away money in, through contests. Uh, one station in this market was trying to give away a swimming pool, and I heard people from North Philadelphia, you know, which does not have grassy areas for a swimming pool, calling trying to win this pool. <laughs> they were so conditioned, and they did such a job that they said, if you answer your phone, I listen to whatever that particular station was, then you can win that amount of money, whatever the frequency was, 101, 99. 
And people were answering their phones. I listened to this 99. So they did a tremendous job on the marketing and they did an effective job in terms of dividing our community. When we weren't divided, we, we were, we were uh, instrumental in electing black officials. We had more elected at that particular time because it's the only place they could go to have an audience to put out their concerns or to familiarize the community with themselves. Uh, they still, to this day, the general market stations that program black music, which they call urban now, they still don't have these interviews or this commitment to the community. Well, I know you're taking an initiative to add to that by starting the AFM radio station, African-American station of your own, where you can dictate what you put out. There is no FCC to tell you what you can say, what you can do. You own it. You can put the program on that you feel fit and you can direct it to the audience that you want to direct it to, which is great. So, you know, as a groundbreaking pioneer of radio, you're doing it again on the internet. And a lot of people are really waiting for that and they're excited about it. Now, I think over the years with the digital divide that was created early on where African-Americans didn't have access to computers or internet, and it kind of left a gap between access to information that was right there at your fingertips because the internet has created a, a, a plethora of, of ways to find out information. Now, you, you remember, I'm not saying how old we both are, but do you remember when the people used to come around selling the Encyclopedia Britannica? Yes. And, and <laughs> that was our internet at the time because that's where you would go to get information about different things. But now it's right there. The information is there. It's a level playing field except for access. So being able to provide access to our young people is really important to move forward to level that playing ground. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I'm, I'm appreciative and grateful for you because you provide a vehicle for me to go ahead and to realize uh, that um, goal that I have of reestablishing another network. And I want to do it for the very reason that you said, because I want to put out information to this African-American community that I think is needed, that they may not give it, get it any other place. It's also a, 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 a vehicle where black folks can interact with each other, exchange ideas, whether they disagree or not, uh, they can have that as a forum. It's also a, a, an, a, um, a vehicle where you can uh, remind people of historical contributions, of lectures, of information that could be uh, very um, um, important to them moving forward. Things like the right race riot in Tulsa and things that we should never forget. The killing of Emmett Till when I was a young boy in Chicago. These are just things that need to be put out there and general market media obviously is not going to protect that. But with that said, I would suggest that everybody, every African-American aspiring person, because of the ease in which it can be done, create this vehicle. If you got a message to get out there, if you want to contribute, create a vehicle where you can do that. And it's not that difficult anymore because of people like you. We absolutely need it. Well, I appreciate that. And, and that is my goal is to provide access. There's so much creativity out there. People just need a way to get it to the masses, you know, and understanding that my goal is to provide those creative people like yourself with, with that avenue, because people are hungry for content. Content is the new currency of today. Uh, I have another question. Uh, oh, go ahead. Let me just say, <clears throat> Thank God for people like you who are tech savvy, because old heads like me who did not have that those kind of things around necessarily, or we were not that trained in it, or we didn't think we could learn, our young folks did, people like you. Now, you know, you can adjust and learn and adapt and bring in people who have learned this technology, but you can't change the fact that you're black, okay? And you're still gonna have the same same issues, 
uh, uh, moving forward as we've had uh, in the past. That's right. That's right. And that's something that we need to take the power from everybody else and, and do what we need to do as a, as a community. Um, right. I, I, I want to know who were some of your mentors along the way through that process that you went through to get to where you are now? Uh, you know, when I, um, I was telling you that I started at DAS as a salesperson. Well, <clears throat> prior to that, I taught school at OIC and I worked under Reverend Leon Sullivan, uh, who was the master in terms of giving back to his community. He started the uh, in OIC training centers around the country where he was teaching individuals how to prepare for a particular trade. And he had follow-up by getting them jobs. Uh, he also started a 1036 plan, which was an investment of uh, $10 for 36 months. And at the time I worked at OIC, so of course I participated as did others in his church and other places. And as a result, he bought a shopping center. He bought a, uh, a different other business enterprises. Uh, that concept has been lost uh, somewhere in the shuffle. But to get back to that, he was one of my mentors for sure, not to mention my father and my coaches coming up. But when I, when I was going to take this job as an account executive at DAS, I didn't have any idea about it, but I played basketball. And um, so when I moved here, I used to go down with my father-in-law to the Philadelphia Athletic Club, which was really a, a club that had maybe one or two blacks, you know, but it was, it was not necessarily for us, but my father-in-law was a doctor and they sent him a membership application, not knowing, and he accepted it and became a member. Uh, so I used to go down with him, and while he was doing the the, uh, the uh, steam rooms and handball, I would be up in the gym playing basketball. Well, these old guys would be up there running around, beating each other up, old white guys. And uh, I would be shooting around at another basket. This one white guy saw me and says, hey, come on and play with me. He wanted to win, and I knew he wanted to win. And so I facilitated that. He, he reached out to me, a black person in a club that was, to me, very segregated, and brought me in there to run with him. I let him win, okay? I controlled the game to the extent that I let him win. Never knew his name. You know, he didn't know mine, but he loved to win. So every other time that they were down there and I happened to be there for practice, he would always grab me and I would play with him. Still didn't know his name or what he did. <laughs> well, when I went out to start my job, the person who offered it to me was an assistant general manager. God bless his soul. His name was LeBaron Taylor, giant in the industry. LeBaron said, uh, you have one more person that you have to interview with. I said, well, LeBaron, I already quit my job. You know, you told me that I had the job. <clears throat> he says, well, it should be okay. I said, it should be okay. <laughs> I mean, I was a little anxious. So the day I went out there to start the job, he came out to the lobby of DAS to greet me and take me back to the last interview that I had to have. I walked back to that last interview and he opened the office and I walked in and it was that guy wow. that I had let win at the gym. <laughs> he saw me. He got up and embraced me. He told my friend he could leave, and he became a mentor. He taught me everything that I knew about radio, about life, about uh, jewelry, about antiques. Uh, his name was Bob Klein, and he also is the one that helped me acquire HAT when I bought it because there was a black guy who professed to own it, but he didn't. There was a Jewish guy who still owned it. So Bob Klein, being Jewish, negotiated the sale with that guy in my name. And so that's how I acquired it. <laughs> you never know yeah. who you're talking to, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great story. That's and a great look, story. You know, our experiences in life prepare us for these moments. The things that I, did, I went through growing up, the things that I was shown, uh, traveling through the South playing ball, you know, dealing with racism and discrimination, hearing the hatred, uh, hu um, hu uh, huddling around with black folks in the dorms, listening to various uh, events, news events, the killing of King. All of these things, all of these things contributed to the philosophy that I have and I developed in terms of what did I wanted to do with, 
with black radio. When I got the wow. opportunity, I started implementing those things. Uh, and it's been, it's been important for our community, especially in the Philadelphia area, but how important is black history month and, and what does it mean to you? Uh, I, I, um, anytime you recognize people who have made contributions, um, uh, is a good thing. Uh, should it be a black history month? Not necessarily. In my opinion, we should, we should be a part of mainstream. It should get to the point where it's done on a regular basis. You know, we don't wait for February to spend money with black media. You know, we don't wait for February to wear red, black, and green. You know, we don't wait for February, you know, to uh, to have have these programs and to play Dr. King excerpts. This is something that should be a part of our everyday life. So whereas I celebrate it, it is not something that I think uh, – really makes that much of a difference to me. I appreciate that. Appreciate that perspective. And I appreciate you coming on to the program. Uh, we're going to do this more and more. We're going to get you back on. We're going to get this radio station rolling, get your content going. People are excited about it because of your history and the things you've done in the broadcast industry. So I want to thank you for coming on and sitting here with me for a few moments, my friend. Hey, I appreciate it. Now, what was that call name that you had, Easy Ed? <laughs> what was that? Eddie G. <laughs> Eddie G. Eddie G. All right. Hey, listen, Write that I down, Cody. People, Eddie G is the man. I'm going to tell you, if you have any interest in establishing a network, you need to go to Eddie G because he makes it easy and uh, he explains things well. So I thank you and I appreciate you. Appreciate you, sir. So. Thanks, right. and we'll talk to you guys next time for our next episode for Spirit of Black History.